You're listening to Chicago Stories, a podcast from City Hall featuring the stories of everyday Chicagoans, as told to Mayor Rahm Emanuel. It's Mayor Rahm Emanuel with Chicago Stories. We're get, uh, joined by Stuart DeBeck, a great Chicago uh, author. Uh, uh, you have a number of books out. Give me the most recent titles. Paper uh, Lantern. St- Paper Lantern, Ecstatic Cahoots, never... The Start of Something. Who's compared in the reviews to uh, Theodore Dreiser, Ernest Hemingway. And I, I, so everybody knows, my first real exposure, kind of personal way, and you caught me, when we opened up the uh, Writers Museum. Mm-hmm. And your remarks were really beautiful. Thank you. Uh, but what, uh, the specific part, you talked about Chicago's working class neighborhoods as a window into the soul of the city. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think those were your words, or to that right. general, and it reminded me obviously of people. The eyes are, you know, a window into the s- soul of a human being. Why did you? Why do you think that? Well, I'm certainly everybody's got their biases, and I, I'm, I mean, I really grew up in a working class neighborhood. It was surrounded by factories. That and neighborhood is Pilsen. Was uh, it Pilsen? First it was Pilsen, then Little Village, Mm -hmm. and you know, really a lot of people just refer to it as the barrio, putting them both together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's accurate. Mm -hmm. There are things that differentiate both places, but there's also just that sense that people who live there are living there for jobs. My father could walk to work. Where did your father work? He worked at the late McCormick Works Mm -hmm. on uh, 26th and Western. I remember going there. He was very proud of his job. Mm-hmm. For me as a child, it was absolutely terrifying. <laughs> I mean, the, the noise, the flames, the racket, the sweat on the men's faces. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, you going back to work, work, what's working class? Working class is stepping into that international harvester factory in July. Yeah, and, in the and, heat and the humidity and, of the outside. And, and just realizing and it was all men. What men do to earn a buck? Mm-hmm. So, you love Chicago, don't you? I do. What What do you find about not just that, that name? Because you write about a number of things, love, but you write, you really are captured by the by the neighborhoods that make up the you know this kind of mosaic of our city. Yeah, I. Well, it's. I mean, can anybody really detach themselves when talking about a place? Mm-hmm from family. Mm-hmm. You know, so the, some of the great writers of place in the United States are from the South. Mm-hmm. And you open their Faulkner or Flannery O'Connor, you open their books up and, and there's grandma and there's mom and dad and, you know, in Faulkner there's the whole sorry history of race. Mm-hmm. So I came from, a, uh, I was born here, but my dad was an immigrant and, and the from family on, a, Poland? A, a little town in Poland called Yelezhna. Mm. We would call it a shtetl. It was a shtetl. I didn't know that. Yeah. All that history was left behind. Uh-huh. And only when I, when I went to uh, Krakow, uh-huh. uh, I teach in Prague every summer, so it's a, it's a train ride. Yeah. When I went to Krakow, I love klezmer music. Really? Yeah. And uh, this, not, not, the, I, not I, the shticky I, kind. I like the soulful. All right. You know. The and ground, the foundation to jazz. There you go. I mean, you you listen to Dixie Nan clarinet, and you listen to klezmer clarinet, and yeah. it's. So I was told the best by by uh, somebody who uh, was a international photographer that if I really loved klezmer, I had to go to Krakow. So I finally got over there, and uh, when I told them my name and asked for a reservation after the first night, you know, have you ever been there? No, it's. There, and th- there are these little tiny right. places that look right. like my grandmother's parlor. Mm-hmm. And I said, do you have a different group tomorrow? Yes, different group. Uh, can I make a reservation? What name? I said, Dibek. Dibek. The guy's been very taciturn up to this point. Begins to laugh like a maniac. I thought what was making him laugh was why all my New York Jewish friends would laugh at my name because it's so close to Dibuk, mm-hmm. which is an evil spirit. Mm-hmm. There's a great play about it. You have to exercise it. It's a tremendous play. Bernstein wrote a ballet, Dibuk. 
He said, not Dibuk, Dibek. No Dibuk, no Dibuk, Dibek, Dibek. Tomorrow go to the Temple Izaka, which is the Holocaust temple. Right. And ask to speak to the director. So I was going to go there anyway, but, you know, to th think I would go to this holy place and ask to speak to the director is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm there, and this guy comes up in Bermuda shorts, full face beard, except for the beard. He's absolutely identical to my father. Identical? Identical. Brown eyes, black hair. I look nothing like my father. Aquiline nose. And I'm staring at him, and he sees me staring, and he comes over. Can I help you? And he gives do we me... Have to, do we have to schedule your bar mitzvah? Is that where this is going? All right. Well, I'll, I'll get to the point. <laughs> I, I said, you know, that's my... Oh, he gives me his card, and I said, and it's, it's Dybbuk. Uh -huh. I said, that's my name. And he looks at me, and he said, no, it isn't. I have to show him my passport, show him my driver's license. It's not like some big embrace here going on here. It's mm -hmm. just total suspicion. I said, uh, I, I don't know anything about the name. Mm -hmm. Only Jews from Krakow. I said, no, no. I grew up Catholic. I went to St. Rita High School. <laughs> and he, he, I, said, I said, and my father, my father went to church. Mm -hmm. Where is he from? I said, Yelezhina, as if I knew where it was. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. He said, Seshetl, 10 kilometers, all Jews. <laughs> so it was like, okay. <laughs> what year did your family come to Chicago then? Well, I've been trying to research it. Uh, my grandfather, Debeck, came uh, in 18, I think, or 19. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to know. I mean, there's a lot of... During the pogroms of 1917, yeah, you think? Yeah. yeah. And do you know where you leave the chosen and decide to become Catholic? I, it's a mystery. Oh, really? Uh, no, I want the cardinal in case he's listening. Oh, right. We're well, all chosen. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Right, i got to get right. blessed. But. No, I'll accept the... You know, <laughs> so. Can I give you a yeah. book? Not that, sure. I should, not that they, the student should be giving the professor a book. No, I'm there's, happy to have a book. There's a great book. What is it? It won the Pulitzer uh, about a, a little over a decade ago Yeah. by Daniel Mendelssohn. Okay. Called the loss, the sto the story of six, the story of six of six million, and it was his. Un it's his story of telling the story as he uncovers the story, what happened to his relatives in a little shtetl, in the Polish Ukrainian. Area, uh, that obviously uh, are eliminated in during the World War Two. Yeah. And he did, it's his discovery of how he discovered his family story. And he, there was no hiding that he was Jewish. You have more of a Madeleine Albright type story. Yeah, it's a Madeleine that. Albright story. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> but no roots in your family, your dad, anything that you well, now look, now that you know this, do you go back and remember no, things I, I'll, 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 Yeah, I mean, I, I've written about it I, without knowing that that was one aspect of what I was writing about. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I've written, a, and this really goes back to your earlier question, because m my family was mysterious to me in a way that has rubbed off on the city. That is, once you experience it in a personal way, you can then project onto so many different immigrant, the immigrant population from so many places. So, I mean, I grew up in this huge Mexican neighborhood. Yeah. But, Man, I mean, when the change, the food got so much better. <laughs> yeah, now it's hipsters, Hipsterville, man. It's Hipsterville, I'm sorry <laughs> to say. But um, when people come, there's so much baggage left behind. And that absence mm -hmm. is, becomes magical. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Totally. So my father would take me to see Michael Dybeck. Uh -huh. When I was a little kid, we would pack up what was called Polish luggage shopping bags with cans and, and old cloak sweaters. And that would be known as schmata, your schmata collector. Exactly, a schmata. And, and we would take this enormous drive from 18th Street, uh -huh. right 18th and Blue Island where we lived. We would drive and drive and then there would be trees and, and it would not be like Chicago anymore. And we'd go through this iron gate and there would be nurses pushing elderly people. And we'd sit in front of this bank of windows, and they'd wheel this old guy out. And he just would sit. 
my father would look and, and he would take his hands and the old guy had these just huge hands and gigantic knuckles. And, he, my, and my father, who was not an emotive man, would, would kiss his hands. Mm -hmm. And then we'd go and, and we'd do that next year. And we'd do that the next year. And each time it seemed like a deja vu. And I finally, I don't know, maybe six or seven at this point would say, I finally said, Dad, who is that old guy? And he said, that's Jaja, grandfather. Oh. He felt he needed me to see, huh. but he was so ashamed that his father was in Dunning. Up here on the northwest side. Yeah, but yeah. I don't, you grew up here, right? Yeah. Well, did you guys, and you, you grew up on the northwest side. We so, go to Albany Park. Okay, then, so, um, so is it a south side thing? Because when I was growing up, maybe this was true, We'd hear the sirens go by, and somebody would say, they're coming for you from Dunning. I mean, it was such a humiliation to then have a parent there. And the other humiliation was they couldn't pay to get them out. Mm -hmm. You know, this is like Dickensian. Right. And so, so, you know, how do you know where you come from? Well, you don't even know who your grandfather is. Yeah. He's, he, they've, they've hidden him away. In the Dibek wing. <laughs> in the Dibek wing. <laughs> so let me ask you, uh, you have a lot, first of all, you have a lot of years of making up for the synagogue payments. We gotta, <laughs> we're going to hit you on that one. So, but on a serious, let me ask you a question, because you write about a working class culture that really defines still our city. Mm -hmm. And you grow up in Pil Pilsen, Pilsen area. Right. Dad works right on the border. Right. And Pilsen, and it's interesting because now they're opening up Thalia Hall, which was, it tells its check routes, right. but now it's, it's like the, a hip restaurant slash music venue. Right across the street is St. Procopius where I went to school. Yeah, okay. And now it's, you know, I don't know, I was there the other day, I'm going to forget, it's horrible, on 18th and Carpenter is a new uh, Vietnamese restaurant that's Oh, okay. I love we were talking uh, about it. So tell me, when you who can tell the story, and you have a beautiful short stories. Thank you. About Chicago and about the grit, mm -hmm. the passion that can, the love and the depth of humanity that still comes even in the, as you said, it's July and you're in a harvester factory. And yet a neighborhood like Pilsen goes, Czech, Czech Polish, Czech Polish Mexican, Mexican, Czech, back to hipster. And, the, <laughs> and I was like, walk me through what you lose and what you gain. And then how does a writer tell that without being just nostalgic? Oh man, that then, is such a great question. Oh good, we'll stop right there. It took me 20 that podcasts, is, that, interviews to find that is, one guest to that say that. That is a laser sharp How do you, question. And, and it's you, can such a, you can be mayor for a day now that you're so nice. No, I'm joking. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. So how do, you, how do you, you know? No, I, I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm not trying to be nice about the question. And it's such a good question that I've been trying to feel my way toward the answer. And uh, so I won't ramble on about it, but I'll say that. Let, let's start out with nostalgia itself. Mm -hmm. You're right. So it, it's one of the wonderful things about, a Bru about Bruce Springsteen. It's one of the limiting things about Bruce Springsteen. How many songs can you listen to about a guy who was a great athlete in high school and he lost it and now it's glory days? Mm -hmm. Okay, one song. I don't need 50 songs about <laughs> glory days. So it's, it's, it, it's a legitimate topic. We all feel it, but it, there's something limiting about it. Number one, and number two is if you're living in a culture, a literary culture that's influenced by Anglo, Anglo feelings, nostalgia is, not, nostalgia is not regarded as, the H Hispanic culture mm -hmm. has got a way more forgiving attitude toward nostalgia mm -hmm. than Anglo cult culture does. So in the great, for me, one of the greatest novels ever written, 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, yeah. you got people walking around in that novel saying, oh, my nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Well, you'd never get that in an in a English novel. I mean, there's an entirely different attitude about it. That is that an acceptance that that's way more of a human feeling mm -hmm. than, than we're willing to accept it for. But, so I'm kind of straddling. But, the, the thing that I think is, the, the, where I want to go with it 
is um, great. I just forgot his name. <laughs> there, there is a, a modern French philosopher, unreadable. Merleau Ponty? No, but anyway, he's a he's a he's a, a post Marxist. Okay. And what I want to get at is, he created this this word that in French is a pun, on ontology, which is of course a pun with ontology. Mm -hmm. And his idea is that in a political world, you grow up as a child, as a young person, and there's all these forces. Oh, he takes it from the first, the, 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 way, the way it comes from is that the opening line to the uh, Marxist Right, Communist Manifesto. Is there is a spirit mm -hmm. haunting Europe. Mm -hmm. And so he takes this notion of hauntedness and he says, you know what? We're all haunted by forces that have happened 30, 40, 50 years in the past, economic forces, mm -hmm. economic in the broadest sense of the word, that we don't even know are haunting us. Well, let me say this. Do you feel... Haunted? Yeah. Well, do you feel that Pilsen is haunted? Yes, absolutely it's haunted. Yeah. It's totally haunted. But do you feel it's being uh, stained by, quote unquote, the hipsters moving in and what's happening there? I, I'm not a hipster fan. I, you know, I mean, I'm, do you think Chicago's uh, character is being affected by the changes that are happening? Or it still has its. Uh, I'm not sure power? about that because um, I, I, I can go to neighborhoods where I see Argyle, for instance. Yeah. When I. And, and one of the things is, and, and I, I mean, I, I just, I don't want to bring race into this as okay. a stereotyped way. Okay. But if you grow up um, in the kind of neighborhood I grew up in. Okay. So we're talking about, uh, to go back to your statement, we're talking about Czech, mm -hmm. some German, Polish, essentially a Slavic neighborhood that then went Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And in fact, after all my relatives moved out of my Bush's house, the first people who moved in were Mexicans. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we, we, we had so much to share. We, we got along wonderfully. We, you know, they couldn't talk Polish. We couldn't talk Spanish. They learned some Polish. I learned some Spanish. Is that why you guys all talk to each other in Yiddish? Because that was the only <laughs> language that worked with everybody? So but let me ask you, but you go to another neighborhood. I don't mean to cut you off, but what I'm trying to get at is you have a unique sight on the character of Chicago, yet we're changing. And you don't want to be nostalgic. On the other hand, do you feel like there's a, par a paradise loss? No, I, I feel it's still here. Mm -hmm. And that there are forces. I'm not worried about hipsters. You know, when Trump, all right, is it, how many people have come here and couldn't stay away from that subject? Mm -hmm. But when he came out with that thing about Mexicans, I grew up with Mexicans. Mm -hmm. You know, my thought about Mexicans is I've never seen harder working people in my life. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they, there's this underculture that runs on their labor. Mm -hmm. I, I, <laughs> when I heard those words, I just, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so for me, and, and he's like selling you an America, he's selling you nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Make America great again. Mm -hmm. That's nostalgia. It's not nostalgia to talk about a neighborhood of, of immigrants, whether it's Argyle, um, whether, you know, whether it's, I, I was a caseworker for three years in, in, in African-American neighborhoods. And I, I mean, I don't think that anybody would argue that part of Chicago's power and greatness comes from the fact that it's a, it's, it's a working class town. Right. Where I feel it different is in San Francisco. Totally. So let me ask you a question. Where does the kid whose dad works at the Harvester facility get to become a short story writer and a poet? Ah, because where, where was that one turn? of the great gifts that you're given that you don't know you're given are those stories. Yeah, but when did you just, I, they're, I they're, they're great material. I, you know, there's a great Yiddish, another Yiddish word. So we're, I don't know why all of a sudden you're bringing all the Yiddish out of me. It's called Midrash, which means it's a, there's a kernel of truth wrapped in a beautiful yes, narrative. Of I never knew how to pronounce that word. Midrash. So yeah. Let me ask you, when did you decide, or who identified in you, it may have been a teacher at St. Rita, who identified in you that you should be a writer, given 
your ability to tap into stories to tell and reflect on something? And where did you decide? How did you decide? Well, I, I mean, I have an essay on and this. Then, and then I got a final piece, yeah. not a final okay. piece, but why did you stick with the short story rather than a... I'll answer that one first. Okay. It's um, t for two things. One is that I, I never separated poetry from the short story. For, I never, I never made, I, I'm not one of those readers and I think that's, a, I don't think that's typical. Mm -hmm. But when I was growing up as a kid and I loved to read, you know, if I read a good story by Edgar Allan Poe and I read a poem by Edgar Allan Poe, I liked them both. I didn't say, oh, I can't like the poem, I can't like the raven but I like the pit and the pendulum. Mm -hmm. I just, right. and, and that, that, you know, granted poetry kind of went off in a, in a post-mod way that a lot of people were not willing to follow. I'm not, I wouldn't argue with that. But um, because of that whole notion of compression and the lyrical and everything, that, I, I, I'm hardly the first person to say that short story owes as much to poetry as it owes to the novel. So um, that, you know, that was, uh, that's kind of connected. The other thing is that I'm not exactly so nuts about the story. I, I like the collections of stories. Because you think they add up together. Yeah, it's, it's that notion of fragmentation. Mm -hmm. That the, for me the way, and this has to do with telling stories. I've got this one story where the woman's talking to this guy and she's saying, when, when we fall in love, it, one of the ways we know we fall in love is that these are going to be our memories, whether it's loving your grandmother, loving a spouse, loving a boyfriend. And she says what we call our lives is how we connect those memories. And it's like you could look up in the stars and somebody says, this is the blah, blah mm -hmm. constellation. And when you're a little kid, you think you're going to see that picture up there. And it's just a bunch of stars that somebody has given this name to. And you think, wait, they, they fooled me. I could, I could call that anything I wanted. And so that, that notion, for, for me, writing in stories, short stories, and letting the reader make the connections is kind of closer to me to the way that memory really works. Huh. That is, we, we make up these stories. These vignettes. These stories of our lives based on only the little bit of our lives that we remember. We don't remember our lives. We remember these, we remember these intense moments and then we connect them. Hmm. So for instance, on Thanksgiving, if, I, if my brother's sitting here and I'm sitting there, we've lived in the same household, we'll have a ex totally different story about, about growing up in that house. Same memories, different. That's a good point. Let me ask you, give me three or four neighborhoods you wish you had in Chicago that you wish you had grown up in? Rogers Park. Why? I moved there when I saw it. It was the old Rogers Park with Ashkenazi. Uh, because it was, <laughs> I would don't, walk Don't in. tell me it's the, you wanted to get your Jewish roots, you just didn't know No. It. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know. I just loved the little, it had little neon stars of David in the window. It was by the lake, which I adore the lake. Uh -huh. There was a feeling I would go to the tailor and he would push, or the cleaner in, on, on Jarvis, mm -hmm. and he'd have the numbers on his wrist. Mm -hmm. And I could feel, I could feel the foreignness of the place. I remember walking down along the lake, mm -hmm. and there were two elderly people, and all I heard in a thick accent, which I love, mm -hmm. is, and when I knew Trotsky, <laughs> and I just wanted to sit down at that bench. You tell sure. me when you knew Trotsky. So, you know, I mean, I could feel the past. And it sounds like a Woody Allen scene. <laughs> just kind of like, let's sit down on this bench. So give me your other neighborhood in Chicago that if, uh, if I love them, I, I love the neighborhood by Wrigley Field because uh, my uncle was a, a Cubs fan. Mm -hmm. And even though I was supposed to be a Sox fan, I was going to say, yeah. He would, take, he would take he me to Wrigley. 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 And, uh, I don't mean Wrigleyville now. Right, but you get off the train yeah. and go right yeah, over yeah, the Yeah, we park. would take the Western Avenue. Yeah. It, it was a trolley then. Uh -huh. So uh, give, me, give me another yeah. one. Well, uh, when I was a caseworker, mm -hmm. Bronzeville, because I was a caseworker for Bronzeville, and all those blues clubs 
Yeah. And I had a guy named Seymour who was on my caseload. He lived in the Dusabo Hotel. Do you know what that is? No. They called it the Mighty Do. Uh -huh. So he was my entry. I could go all these clubs <laughs> I was, had second thoughts about going to. With Seymour, I could go anywhere I wanted. And so I heard Howlin' Wolf. Oh, okay. Muddy Waters. I mean, it, it was just a kick in the neighborhood. Let me ask you this. Why do you... I always say Chicago is the most American of American cities. I wouldn't argue with you about okay. that. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, and we have great writers here. But when you think about America's contribution to music, mm -hmm. there are three that I think are singular American. Okay. Uh, blues. Mm -hmm. Gospel. Mm -hmm. And jazz. Yeah. Okay. All of them have their roots in history, and not just kind of tangentially deep in Chicago. Yeah, absolutely. Why? I mean, I know the history of well, uh, blues up the Delta, Chicago, what Chicago meant for that, yeah. right? So but I mean, why, do you, why do you think the most American American city is also the home of the most American forms of music? Well, I think you just anticipated my answer, which is that because of the trains and the crossroads mm -hmm. and the industry that was, were bringing all these, so we had, mm -hmm. you talked about uh, Klezmer's relationship to jazz and blues, so that you had this, this migration. You had that huge migration from the South, which was the most essential one. Right, the Great Migration. Yeah, the Great Migration. And, you know, and, and they were on their way to Detroit as well as Chicago, although I think Chicago just had more resources and mm -hmm. more opportunities. More opportunities. So I, but I, I think it, the fact where it, where it exists as a migratory route mm -hmm. uh, was, was, was really the, the, main, the main answer. So we have a lightning round. You ready? All right. Thick or thin? Pizza. Oh, come on. It should be thick, but for me it's thin. Okay. Cubs or Sox? All right. I'm not... I'm, I, Go ahead. I just love... I love... I think we're so lucky to have both those teams. Okay. Great. I, I got to take them both. Really? Yeah. I go, I go during the summer, I go to both, okay. both stadiums. All right, I'll let you get away with it only because I like you. Uh, <laughs> river or lake? Whoa. I grew up on a sanitary canal. The, the uh, lake is sacred to me. You, you, can't, and, you, but don't, the get Cubs, you don't get a Cubs Sox answer, oh, so you on. only get one both. You got to pick. You got to pick. We got 10 As seconds. a writer, I'm going to take the river. Okay, there it is. Uh, the Sears Tower will stay consistent. Hancock. Sears. Stewart? I had a friend who did contracting on it. You like teaching at Northwestern? Love it. Congratulations. Thanks for Thank being you. here. Thanks. Stewart's the best. My pleasure. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Time. Thank you. You're listening to Chicago Stories with Mayor Rahm Emanuel. You can subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tweet your guest ideas using hashtag ShyStories. Thanks for listening.